Today on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, you will learn how a merchant's desk is constructed. The Appalachian area is comprised of 13 eastern states covering 205,000 square miles of rugged, mountainous terrain. It stretches from New York to Mississippi, with West Virginia being the only state totally encased in the area. When this region was first settled, the immigrants had to travel over the Appalachian mountain range with only what they could carry or haul by wagons. They would make furniture and other wooden items that were necessary and functional. Hey Greg, how you doing? Hey Gerald, how you been? Doing good. What can I do for you today? I'd like to order some cornmeal if I could. All right, about how much are you looking for? About 20 pounds. All right, let me get my ledger out and I'll write yeah. you out. Nice desk. Well, thank you. How much is 20 pounds? Well, 20 pounds is running about 750. Okay. Does that sound about right? Sounds good, yeah. All right. All right, Gerald, here's your corn. Here's about All 20 right. pounds. Thanks, Greg. All right, you have a good day. Enjoy well, that. See you later. See you later. Today, what we have here is a grist mill. The first question would be, what is grist? Grist is a grain. It's any sort of grain that has an outer hull to it, um, has an outer shell like corn, and then the inner part, which can be crushed, and then that part can be used as a food source. What to do to make this mill operate would be to um, put your grain, corn, or whatever down into the chute. As it comes to, down through here, this is also a cleaner and separator. Uh, your grain that you want comes down and goes through this chute. Inside this box are the two uh, stones that I was talking about. As it comes down through here and grinds, the product comes out onto this screen. Now this screen is set with certain um, size squares. We have different types of screens for different types of mills up here. This one I have set up for cornmeal right now. The um, product comes out here, this sifts it, your um, chaff or your offal, A-U-F-A-L, comes out this, and that is your outer shell. Your edible part comes down in here, um, that gets bagged up, and that's what we use to eat with. This is a 1930 model Stover motor. It's an eight horsepower, 450 horse. This particular model was sold in the Sears and Roebuck catalog um, for two years. This one was just a ge good general um, all-purpose farm type of um, motor. This is known more as a hit-miss motor. What that means is that as it goes around, um, it does not fire at every revolution. We're here at Heritage Farm Museum and Village with Audie Perry. Um, Audie, when did this uh, uh, facility start? Well, back in the 1800s, this was uh, two German dairy farms, mm -hmm. the Schaefer's and the Blatt's, and then my parents moved out here with three small children in yeah. 1973. <laughs> I was two, and um, uh, they wanted to raise their kids in the country, and, and they went to just knock down a little burned out house, and they discovered that it, had, it was made of hand-hewn logs, wow. probably 200 years old, and so that began their journey of who, who are these people and why yeah. did they do this, and, and, and their journey into Appalachia began at that moment. You, um, you have seven museums? There, yes, there are 30 different buildings, Wow. Uh, 15 of them hand-hewn logs, and then um, seven of those have been uh, turned into West Virginia's first Smithsonian affiliation. Right. Um, and then we've added other buildings like a working blacksmith forge and a uh, one-room schoolhouse yeah. and fun things like that. I know you've got a lot of children's activities here. You want to touch on that? Yes, we do, um, we do about 6,000 school children each year from wow. the school system. We've specifically designed our curriculum, um, mm -hmm. whether they're coming for social studies or science or math or English. Yeah it's all one story, right? <laughs> and, and it's that story of that proud Appalachian uh, pioneer who was able to overcome amazing challenges with ingenuity and creativity. Yeah. 
And um, so we do that by helping the children experience the past, by working with our artisans, yeah. but then also helping them appreciate all that we have today because of their ingenuity and hard work. Yeah. And then we take them to what we call the maker space, right. um, or our Six Simple Machines playground, and they explore how work got done and how they may be able to think about what it's able to do in the future. So they create and make themselves. Yeah. I notice you also have some facilities you rent out to uh, people that want to spend the night in, a, uh, in that type of an environment. Sure. Uh, originally, mom and dad um, thought people would want to come and live like it was back in the mm -hmm. day. No. No. <laughs> people no. like to talk about the good old days. They do not like to live like they it. They like so, the comfort. Right. So we have five inns, uh, that, uh, so some log cabins that look like the 1800s, but they've been updated with running water and electricity and HVAC. And That's great. Yeah. So um, spend some time in yeah. yesteryear. And we also have a 1940s Virginian caboose right. that they can spend some time uh, yeah. riding the rails, so to speak. Okay. What's, what's your hours of operation here? We are open year-round, Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. And every Wednesday, May through September, we do a special Kids Day, yeah. so focus on the children during the summer. And then every Saturday, May through Christmas time, we do Way Back Weekends, yeah. where um, people can come and enjoy a, a walk through yesteryear yeah. with the petting zoo and the wagon rides and the artisans. I know that's really popular. You get a big crowd in on those Saturdays yes. and the Wednesdays when the kids come in. Right, yeah. a lot of fun. And okay. then the other days are guided tours, so more intimate uh, tour moments for those who are wanting to come and yeah. tour the museums mm -hmm. on a personal basis. Uh, do you also have some facilities you rent out for conferences and stuff? Yes, uh, so we have meeting facilities that can hold up to 200 mm -hmm. um, and we have a conference center which is in the 1850s dairy barn. Wow. It's 9,000 square feet and it can eat, sleep and meet 40 people. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of fun just being surrounded by those beautiful hand hewed logs and stone uh, and then we've added uh, uh, in the back for the showers and yeah. kitchen and all that kind of facilities but it's a it's a really neat space. And you have a cafeteria here or a cafe here. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, our Daily Bread Cafe, so people can just come out and enjoy some lunch. lunch. Yeah. Uh, it's open from 11 to 2 each day, mm -hmm. and um, they can come and just enjoy lunch and, and share some time with our artisans, whether or not they want to come to uh, the museums that day or not. Okay. Audie, I appreciate you letting us come here and, and film the uh, Miller Shed uh, and, and the Merchant's Desk that we've got over there. I appreciate it. This is the original merchant's desk here at Heritage Farm Museum and Village. Uh, when I open it up, I'll show you why I believe it's a merchant's desk and not a schoolmaster's desk. But I do want to show you some of the construction. Uh, this is a mortise and tenon joint right here. Uh, notice the legs. Although it does have some turning here, they're very blocky going down. And there's no stretchers at the bottom. So when this desk is moved, or if you inadvertently kick the bottom of the leg, it puts a huge stress on this top mortise and tenon joint. And I believe that's uh, one of the reasons they failed. Uh, the other reason is that they probably used animal hide glue. The modern glue we have today is much stronger. If you notice, this is an exposed mortise and tenon joint. If you notice here, it is beginning to fail. I believe the reason this is failing is the bottom of the leg is not reinforced. So when you drag the desk or if you inadvertently kick the bottom of the leg, it puts stress on this joint. Another thing I would like to point out is you notice the end grain of these boards right here. These boards are what is actually holding the bottom in place. And I thought that was rather unsightly. So when I redesigned and built uh, the merchant's desk that I built, I changed that right there. Also changed the leg design. Uh, if you notice, there's two very small hinges here. Uh, these hinges are showing quite a bit of wear. And 
I don't believe that they're really strong enough for this particular purpose, although this has survived uh, probably 150 years. But when I built mine, I put a continuous hinge on it. So let's open it up now and look inside of it. If you notice, it does have a way of securing the lid here, but because the hinges aren't very strong, I don't want to let go of it. The reason I believe this is a merchant's desk is because this has several dividers in the back, and then it also has a divider here. If this was a schoolmaster's desk, I don't believe it would have the dividers, it would have just the shelf. A uh, couple other things I'd like to point out is th the bottom are boards that are just nailed onto the sides and then it's reinforced with the boards that are nailed onto that that are visible from the front. It does have a uh, uh, mortise, half mortise lock here, which it doesn't show the upper part, so this lid may have been replaced. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery. In woodworking, you need to know how to safely use your equipment. When creating dust, make certain you have good cross ventilation, a dust collection system, or a dust respirator. If you're applying a finish, please use a NIOSH approved respirator for that particular chemical. A good set of hearing protection is necessary to protect your hearing. And of course, eye protection is a must. I like to start with the legs. Here you can see I've got some cherry boards that I've already dimensioned to the proper length width. Uh, I've already cross cut the top of the front legs at the correct angle using a bevel gauge. I also inspect the legs to make sure there's no defects. Here's an example of one that's got a split. So this one can't be used. I need to set that aside. So now I'll take a square and line up the bottom. Put a clamp on it real quick. So now I'm ready to lay out for the mortises. I like using a steel ruler. And here you measure up from the bottom the required amount and put a mark and square across. That way you're marking all four at the same time so they're all alike. I like using a half inch shoulder on the top and bottom of the mortise. At the top of the legs, if you notice, there's a difference. The back legs are longer than the front legs. So I need to measure down on the back legs and measure down on the front legs. And it's very important that the bottom mortise line up properly on all four of these legs. So once I get those marked, then I need to mark where the mortise will be uh, how far in from the edge. And here I use a little tick mark, which shows me which face goes against the fence on the mortising machine. So now that I've got all that set up, let's go over to the mortising machine and I'll show you how to set it up so we can complete these mortises. Now here's one that I've already cut the mortise on, and then I cut it apart. So if you notice, you have a real sharp corner right through here, and then right here is where the chisel stops, and the drill bit goes down another eighth of an inch. And if you look over here, you'll see several places where the chisel doesn't go all the way down, but the drill bit does. So there's very little to clean up. It cleans up real easy with a bench chisel. The depth stop is where I want it. I have the fence set. I have my hold downs set and I have my guide block set. So now it's just a matter of lining up my marks. I like putting a little tick mark on the end so all of them will be exactly the same and then just going ahead and drilling out the mortises. Merchant's desk has several lamb's tongue carved into the legs, so I thought I would show you how to do that. Now, a lot of people would think you need a 
a lot of carving chisels to do this and it certainly helps but I'm going to show how to do it using just a bench chisel. It's very simple. Before I show you how to carve that, uh, I need to show you the five different areas of a lamb's tongue that you need to be aware of. You have the point or the tip of the tongue here. You have the bottom of the valley. You have the apex. And then you have what I call the transition where it goes from a chamfer to the lamb's tongue. Each of these points uh, needs to be accurate in order for it to look good. The other item that you need to consider is the whole lamb's tongue has to be symmetrical, proportional to the depth of the chamfer. So everything is based on that. The apex, or the high part of the lamb's tongue, is one half the depth of the chamfer. And then from the apex, I go one times the depth of the chamfer over to the valley and then from the valley to the point is one times the depth of the chamfer and that's the proportion that I go with and I think that seems to work the best. Let me show you how I do this. I'm going to turn this around. The template that I make I prefer it to reference the end of the leg and I prefer it to have a little point here which matches with the chamfer. So you can see, and then that makes it very easy to scribe the outline of the lamb's tongue. And you do this on all sides. That way all of the critical points will be lined up perfectly. Now I do it very similar to the way you do a mortise. I just start and in the middle and start hogging out. The point here is just to get out the bulk of the material as quickly as you can. You always need to be aware of the grain direction. Uh, that's true with any woodworking task you're doing, but it is especially true with carving. Now my goal here is just to get it close to the line. If you turn your bench chisel over, then you're less likely to gouge in at the very bottom of the valley. Sometimes it helps to take a little bit of sandpaper wrapped around a dowel and then you can just come in here, clean it up. Using my miter gauge with a stop block, I cut all of these boards to the exact same length. These will be the bottom of the desk. Now I've got the front, the back, and the two sides dimensioned. I've gone through my drum sander, so now I'm ready to cut my tenons. The sides will have an angle cut on it like this, and it's easier to cut the tenons before I cut this angle. So when I'm cutting, tenons on a wide panel. I prefer to use a dado blade and set it down flat. It's easier to control. Got a miter gauge and a stop block here. And what I'm going to do is cut a tenon on my stretcher that goes on the bottom and check it for a fit first. Now I need to cut my angle on my sides and what I'm going to do is use some carpet tape, stick these together then I can cut them both at the same time on the bandsaw and then run them over the joiner at the same time before I separate them. So what I like to do is go ahead and use a fence as a reference so I know they'll be lined up properly. I'm ready to begin assembly of the merchant's desk. Before I assemble it, I wanted to remind you that 
The back has the wide tenon like the sides. And I'm here by myself, so I'm gonna have to kind of hustle along once I start. After the two sides are glued, I begin the assembly process. I start with the back and the pigeon holes. Notice the biscuits are used for alignment. Then I slide the dividers in place. Then the front is glued in place and the pencil tray. And finally, the other side is glued on. Then everything is clamped together. Never have too many clamps. The bottom of the desk is made up of several shiplap slats. If you notice, the first and last boards are notched to fit around the legs. I install a small bead of glue and then use brads to secure each of the boards. A spacer is used to ensure there is room for expansion. This design is an improvement over the original because it hides the end grain on the boards, which produces a cleaner look. So the bottom goes together real quick. I incorporated a bottom shelf to strengthen the merchant's desk. These boards are installed with glue and blind nails. small gap is placed between each board with a spacer. To blind nail, I install a brad and then clip off the head of the nail. This leaves about a sixteenth to an eighth inch of the nail protruding above the board. So when the shelf board is installed, and a clamp is applied, the board will not slide around. The clamps are left until the glue is set in place. So now I'm ready to apply a finish. I prefer not to use a stain. I prefer a dye. Now dyes come in powder or liquid. If they come in a powder, then you can mix them with water or alcohol. And after you mix them, you'll need to strain it through a filter to make sure any of the uh, powder that's not in solution is not in your finished product. If you mix the liquid, then you can mix it with the water or alcohol. When you put a alcohol-based dye on, it dries very fast, so you have to be careful that you don't have lap marks. And of course, it can be applied with a rag, a brush, foam brush, or you can spray it. But all of those, for a large project, uh, increases the opportunity for lap marks. So I'm going to use a water-based dye. And instead of mixing my own from a powder, I've decided to go with a uh, pre-manufactured uh, water-based tint. I mixed general finish dye stain to get the custom color I want. Then I applied it with the HVLP spray system. Then carefully wipe off all the excess so there's no drips or runs and the color is consistent. After the dye stain is dried, I spray on a clear top coat with the same HVLP spray system.
Thanks for watching the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. For more information on today's project, go to AppalachianHeritageWoodshop.com. Be proud of your Appalachian heritage. The Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services, Common Sense Internet Marketing and Web Design. Our Internet Marketing Commissions are based on results. Robinson and McElvey, Thinking Business, Practicing Law.